What's up, Sats fans? Welcome to Swan Signal Live. I am your host, Sam Callahan, the lead analyst at swanbitcoin.com. Uh, welcome, and we have another great show for you guys today. Uh, we have Peter St. Onge on with us. He is a PhD economist um, at Heritage Foundation, as well as a fellow at the Mises Institute. But before we get into the show, um, I want to talk about Pacific Bitcoin. Uh, that is the conference that we're throwing in beautiful Santa Monica, October 5th and 6th. You can check it out at PacificBitcoin.com. If you use the promo code right here, Signal, you can get 21% off today on your tickets. Um, we got great list of speakers, workshops, satellite events, parties. Um, it is a fantastic time. Last year was a big hit. So check it out, PacificBitcoin.com. Um, and without further ado, let's bring on Peter St. Onge. Uh, can't wait to have this discussion with him. So Peter, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so um, you kind of came onto the scene recently, at least on my radar, uh, because you make all these great videos. And I think you just summarize what's going on in the macro environment so well. It's so easy to understand. Um, and I agree with a lot of your takes. So I was like, I got to get this guy on the show. And so welcome. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for saying that. It was... Uh... It was kind of a lark. That was something I used to. I, I used to be an, an MBA professor over in Taiwan, and the students were generally hungover, and so <laughs> I I had to give them a reason to show up on time. And so I would do these little five minute sticks at the beginning of class. I figured it would illustrate the material so that you know strategic marketing is not just a textbook topic, but it's actually out there in the live world. And I actually enjoy doing those, uh, and I'm not in academia anymore, but I figured, well, let me get back to doing that anyway. And I mean, I've been floored. A lot of people like them, and m most of them don't even seem hungover, so that's, <laughs> that's good. Apparently, apparently, I have a wider audience than I thought. Yeah, much wider, I'd say. I'd love to hear about your backstory a little bit. I mean, um, how did you end up in Taiwan? What's your background? Um, how did you become like a fellow in the Mises Institute? Um, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about that. Sure. So I went to university at McGill up in Canada for economics. And then I came out and actually joined a big uh, telecoms infrastructure company called Harris. And I was doing marketing. So my mom was super disappointed. She was like, you have this, this wonderful economics degree. What are you doing that for? Uh, and anyway, I struck it rich on dot coms. I read the uh, Paul Krugman interview back in 1998 where he said that the internet was going to turn out to be no more of a, you know, uh, it was going to have no more impact than the fax machine because he thought we were all going to run out of things to say. And so I thought <laughs> that's, that's such a dumb take. And, you know, I mean, I, I didn't know any better. I thought Paul Krugman was a normal intelligence person. So I figured, well, there's probably going to be a lot of people who are normal intelligence who are underestimating the Internet. So I put all of my money into options on Yahoo and then SoftBank, which is basically just recycling all of the Internet business plans in Japan. Uh, so I retired on that at 25, and I spent about five years goofing around, backpacking, and and uh, wasting my youth. Uh, that got a little bit boring, and so I went back for the PhD, uh, and then went over to Taiwan just to try something new. Uh, I grew up partly in Japan, and so I wanted to try a new country. Uh, we stopped in Taiwan for like two days on a stopover from Thailand, and just everybody was so nice and... Like the streets are so alive. Like anybody who's been to Taiwan is can be knocked over. There's, it, it's almost like one of those paintings from like the 15th century where, where you've got this town square and you've got you know you got the street vendor, you got the dog, uh, trying to grab the sausage out of the kids' hands. You know mm -hmm. you just have like a hundred things going on in this square, and that is literally Taiwan. It is so full of life, and I just love that. So, uh, joined a program that was pro Austrian economics. It was kind of one of the home bases of uh, Hayekians and Rothbardians in China because, you know, they can't really talk in China. So they come over to Taiwan and pretend it didn't happen. Uh, so I was over there for about five years and then came back to North America just before COVID. So perfect timing. Wow. So what was it like? You know, you were kind of trained in academia, um, got a PhD and everything. I assume there was a lot of like Keynesianism being taught there, but then you get exposure to right. Austrian ec ec economics. Did that just kind of like, you were like, what is this? Like this kind of contradicts a lot of other things that I've learned. 
Um, did you come in with an open mind? Did it just kind of make sense to you? Because uh, I think a lot of people kind of get stuck in the ways of learning uh, Keynesian economics, and then they see Austria and they're like, no, no, no. But it seems like you kind of latched onto it. Yeah, I mean, my entire undergraduate program, I had never heard of Mises. You hear of Hayek because he's got the Nobel and he did the thing on information. But um, mm -hmm. I mean, you never hear, you know, the Austrian school uh, opinions of Hayek, things like um, denationalization of money. I'd never heard of Rothbard. So I'd literally stumbled across all these guys in a bookshop uh, in Tokyo. I came across Mark Skousen's Making of Modern Economics. And in that, he, he's not necessarily pro-Austrian, but to his credit, he lays out all of the schools, right? So he goes through uh, Marxism, Keynesianism, uh, Chicago, and Austrian. And so that was my first exposure. And the Austrian, the way that Mark framed it, I thought made a lot of sense. And so I went out and explored it. Uh, and then, you know, in uh, Bitcoin kind of, I mean, Bitcoin came in later, right? It didn't exist yeah. back then. Um, but what happened with Bitcoin was I, I'd always loved the idea of a private currency that had nothing to do with the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, I was a fellow at Mises for the summer, and I was, ah, that's what it was. Uh, I, I'd written a paper on the effect of money printing on the fall of the Song Dynasty in China. All right, oh, cool. and that which, which matters because when that dynasty collapsed on itself because of money printing, that's what allowed the Mongols to conquest China. Okay, so at the time, it would be almost like if, um, you know, Sitting Bull, not only did he defeat Custer, but he like marched on Washington and occupied the White House. I mean, it was, it was such a tremendous disparity to have this ragtag bunch of nobodies, just a bunch of yahoos out in the plains who took over, you know, the Song Dynasty at that time was like half of world GDP. I mean, it was, it was just wow. astoundingly dominant. And so this has always been a mystery. There's, there's this whole cottage industry of academics who sit around and try to figure out why uh, the Mongols were able to do it. And so my hypothesis was that it was money printing, right? Because mm -hmm. the Song Dynasty invented paper money, right? It right. invented the printing press. And one of the first things that they use, well, first they used it for porn, which is always the case. No way. So, you know, basically manga, like uh, like 11th century hentai. Uh, and then the next thing they figured out was that they could print money with this thing and they could, you know, declare that you accept those scripts of paper in exchange for the silver on pain of death. And so that, of course, you know, now we know the rest of the story because it's happened so many times, but you get the hyperinflation. Once you get the hyperinflation, the government collapses. It starts trying to tax everybody. Uh, it doesn't have enough to pay the military, so the military is no longer loyal. The major landowners in China actually generally cut deals with the Mongols because the taxation had gotten so bad and the Mongols were promising hard money. So, I mean, it, it, it was like an inside job at the end of the day where they said, look, we don't care if you're a bunch of yahoos who, you know, eat dinner naked, whatever. Just save us from this government over here, which is destroying everything. Wow. So anyway, I, I, that, that's kind of a fascinating period. I did a paper on that, and then somebody reached out asking what I thought about Bitcoin. And so I started getting into it. Uh, and then while I was a, a summer uh, fellow at Mises, I wanted to write an article praising Bitcoin because at that time, most Austrian economists were anti-Bitcoin. They were gold bugs, and they'd really cut their teeth in the 1970s. And so the standard, was, I mean, it's, it's basically what gold bugs always think about Bitcoin, that it... You know, it's fake, it's imaginary, it's goofy, it's fraud, uh, it's just going to collapse. And um, so Jeff Dice, uh, he was the president of Mises at the time, and to his credit, he said, you know what, go for it. Uh, I'm certain you got a crap load of pushback because the audience at that time was pretty hostile to Bitcoin. Uh, but we went with it, and then I published, I think that was in 2014. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was my first article on Bitcoin. And then ever since then, I've been... I'd, I'd actually until recently been mostly writing on Bitcoin. Uh, uh, nowadays, most of what I do in my day job is dealing with the broader economy. So I talk about that. But um, uh, over the years, most of my writing has been on Bitcoin. How have those conversations shifted over the years, like in the, in the Mises Institute um, with the, your Austrian um, economist circles around Bitcoin? Because I know there was a lot of pushback in like the early mm -hmm. 2010s. Um, how has that sentiment shifted? 
I think it's gotten a lot better. Um, unfortunately, what there's a saying, uh, I think it was Max Planck, that science advances funeral by funeral. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain <laughs> age gap that I think is insurmountable um, with Bitcoin. It's very rare to find somebody in their 60s or 70s who can, who's willing to open their mind and to get on board with it. Uh, this is going to be especially true for academic economists. They kind of build up a career... Um, a corpus of papers, they have their citations, like they've kind of got their territory and they tend to be very, very reluctant to go down any path that devalues their existing scholarship. So, I mean, generally speaking, professors are complete write-offs. They are literally as closed-minded as you could possibly imagine, which is ironic because, of course, academia thinks it is these super uh, <laughs> open-minded people. But, I mean, uh, like uh, literally having... Having tried many times in my life, do not bother debating a professor. Uh, you're just going to waste your time. If you want to make fun of him, but he is not going to change his mind. He is, <laughs> he, his, his entire career depends on his not agreeing with you. Um, but anyway, right. So there are some older Austrians who are at least open to Bitcoin. They might say something like, well, I don't really get it, but, you know, maybe it'll work. Um, but, you know, the young Austrians, I think, are overwhelmingly pro-Bitcoin mm -hmm. Bitcoin as a concept is completely aligned with Austrian economics, which views money as just a, a good like any other. Yeah. It has demand. It has supply. It's not some magic, you, you know, sort of layer that's uh, put over the economy um, by the sky man and government. So it's the sort of Menger Mises view of money, I think, is 100 percent consistent with Bitcoin. There's allowances, you know, how uh, it is Lightning Network going to reduce the transaction costs enough so that, I mean, there, there are details you can debate what the uptake is going to be. But in terms of sort of a core level, like is Bitcoin legitimate, I think according to Austrian economics, 100%. And I mean, I should mention that Austrian economics itself, it's today we call it Austrian economics, but really Austrian economics is just classical economics. It's just a continuation of the past 500 years, going back to the Spanish scholastics, as basically yeah. just saying, this is economics without this stupid Marxist Keynesian interlude. So, I, I, it, you know, it's it, it's not like sort of some culty, like you have to believe weird things. It's simply an evolution of what economics has been going back uh, 500 years plus. Gotcha. Well, it's good to hear that the young uh, the young individuals uh, at the Mises Institute and in the Austrian uh, for sure economist yep. circles are are kind of leaning into Bitcoin a little bit because um, I right. I agree with you and. Um, you brought up China. You brought up the history of China and the money printing. Um, China also, I think, added more debt than any other country uh, since the pandemic. And they kind of now find themselves in a, I would say, tricky situation. Uh, lately, they've been hitting the news. You got the yuan falling. You got they entered deflation. Um, and there's a lot of censorship going on over there. So a lot of people are getting spooked a little bit. There's a lot of investors, a lot of capital flight. Um, from foreign investors going out of China. What are your views on it right now? Because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion always around China because it's like a black box. Um, yeah. But you've kind of made a couple of videos and I, I thought you highlighted things well. So what's your current takes on China? What's the risks that are there? Yeah, I mean, China is a black box. It's really intentionally a black box. They hide everything. Uh, there's an entire industry that sits around trying to cook up shadow statistics. And I mean, like literally this... Um, China Beige Book is one of the big ones. They're oh, yeah. paid, you know, big fees by like real banks to figure out what the heck's happening in China because nobody knows. Uh, by all accounts, China lies about the statistics. There have been estimates. Actually, there was a paper by the Fed. I want to say the Atlanta Fed, which estimated that China's economy as a whole is overestimated by one third. So, I mean, really, wow. nobody ever knows what's happening in China, <laughs> um, you know, but it's we can sort of gain clues here and there um, uh, from the statistics that we can see The manufacturing is crashing. They are right on the edge of deflation. Uh, and, you know, they built up now about 50 trillion dollars in non-financial debt. Forget financial. OK, that's on top of that. That is a mm -hmm. lot more debt than even the U.S. has compared to GDP, the government was trying, they've known that's a problem for a while. And a lot of that debt goes into really unproductive stuff. For example, it's a guy living over there. I just read an interview with him. He said that the bus stops that he takes to work 
Okay. In the course of two years, they knocked them down and rebuilt them three times. The first time they needed it. The second time they upgraded with, you know, a little electric bullet, uh, bulletin boards or whatever. The third time they made it. So it's like, it's got like as much steel as a tank. And he's like at, at some point, right? Because what happens is the local governments have to show that they've got GDP growth. And the way to do that is to borrow money and spend it on anything. So there's an enormous amount of debt in China that is now completely unproductive. But I want to estimate almost half of it. A lot of that went into companies, right? They're companies that are way uh, over capacity. There's something like 10 million. There's enough capacity for 10 million extra cars compared to what China either sells or exports. And I mean, this is across the board, whether it's solar, you know, in, in, um, in a lot of manufacturing industries, the government has poured cheap capital in because it's identified those industries as the wave of the future, particularly in green stuff. And then there is so much obscene overcapacity that all these guys are losing money. So the bottom line is, you know, youth unemployment just hit a record. Uh, is over 20%, and then the government went dark. They said, we're not going to be yeah, publishing right. this one anymore because we got to save money. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so, right, China's got a rough patch here. Fundamentally, the government, you know, they had too much central planning. The government was steering trillions towards industries that like for whatever reason. Either they were state-owned or they were in one of these industries of the future. And in the meantime, it was harassing regular companies, the productive companies. So it was cracking down on Alibaba, on Ant. Um, the Communist Party felt that this rising class of Chinese billionaires were a political rival. And so they they disappeared Jack Ma for a while there. You know, oh, yeah, Jack, a couple of years. Yeah, and Jack Ma was like the local equivalent of Steve Jobs. Okay, like, you know, if you would watch like a Chinese drama and the, you know, if the kid had a poster on his wall he wanted to start a business someday he would have a poster of jack ma so i mean that 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 was like culturally he's a very significant person and so of course that made him a threat right so they rounded up a whole bunch of people of course they had this crap down in hong kong you know the instinct of xi is to grab control uh and so in many ways he's killing the golden goose that really made china that pulled it out of the gutter and you know was sort of handing it the future in terms of the long run, I mean, China's certainly going to have a hard patch here. And we'll see if they navigate it. We'll also see if the Chinese people put up with it. There's actually a lot more civil unrest in China than we ever see. Uh, a couple of years ago, I used to teach about the Chinese economy. It was like 2015. And I was shocked to discover that there were something like 800 violent riots per year, like significant disturbances. This is back in 2015. And I would have sworn mm. that there was absolutely nothing happening in China. It was completely stable. So every so often you see little snippets. You know, for example, there was a bank run a couple months ago where people were pounding on the, on the, on the doors to get their money back. And the government was uh, moving their tanks, just driving around the block. You know, I guess you got to drive them so, every so often or they go bad. So, I mean, there's, there's kind of these little snippets where we can see that there's actually a lot of unrest in China. Uh, it gets, you know, of course, censored and suppressed at the local level. Uh, and so as the economy gets worse, um, you, you know, Xi's instinct is to be very aggressive, to crack down uh, on any kind of dissent. And then meanwhile, the Chinese people in general, they are much less obedient, I think, than, than uh, people in general imagine. Uh, so China could blow up. At the same time, I think in the long run, in this country, or in the West rather, we have, you know, again, sort of this intellectual industry that loves talking about how China's all fake. And uh, it, yes, a lot of it is fake, but fundamentally, you know, up, up until Xi, at least, up until President Xi, China had been following the free market model that built the West, that made the West rich in the first place, while we've been abandoning it. So, you know, long run, I don't think the heat's off. Um, I don't think we're looking at a fall of the Berlin Wall moment where, you know, the West can, can uh, celebrate triumphantly. Uh, I think at this point, sort of the short of it is that both China, the U.S. and Europe are all becoming more like each other. So we have increasingly state-controlled economies that are built on debt that are sort of floating on smoke and mirrors, uh, that are crushing the private sector, and all of us are kind of going down the same hole. Hmm. Yeah, you saw when there was kind of uh, protests outside the bank. They also yeah. did their, they have their own social credit system and their CBDC over there. 
and they kind of cut off access to the public transportation for those protests. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was incredible. Um, I, I read a piece from the Financial Times that journalists there and economists can't say the D word. They can't say deflation. They can only say low inflation, right? Because <laughs> they're also get censored uh, for saying the D word. Um, but, you know, I was, I was wondering, you know, obviously thinking about how that impacts the United States, you know, what would a China blow up do to, to the global economy? I mean, it's, it's hard to fathom given how important it is to global trade. Obviously, there's a dependence there with the United States um, as a major trading partner. Um, what kind of spillover effects would you anticipate if China does enter kind of a deep, steep recession? Yeah, I mean, near term, some of the bigger effects would be a flood of cheap exports. Um, the Chinese yuan already hit a 16-year low. And if China hits a real crisis, that's likely to go a lot lower. That'll make Chinese goods even cheaper than they currently are. So, you know, that would hit a lot of, uh, let's say, Western manufacturers who are already on the ropes. Hmm. China, a lot of what they buy now is natural resources. And those overwhelmingly come from... Uh, developing countries, so Africa, South America, Australia. <laughs> uh, and so a lot of that will dry up. So that'll hit, you know, those as exporters. Um, and then, you know, of course, you got the financial aspect. So what kind of contagion you might expect. The right. one of uh, Joe Biden's cabinet members, uh, Raimondo, she was just um, she's a commerce secretary. She was just over in Beijing and we don't know what they talked about. Usually commerce secretaries are trying to drum up business. Um, but in this case, they might have been discussing some of the contagion, uh, more or less the U.S. saying that if things get real bad, then we'll have your back and we'll back you up. You know, whatever, however much countries pretend to fight, fundamentally, they're all sort of on the same team, which is this cartel to exploit the people. And so in this case, they kind of don't want each other to collapse uh, because, you know, that would sort of expose the whole thing. Right. So the U.S., Europe. We are almost as Ponzi as China in terms of a very thin amount of actual wealth holding up this giant, you know, mushroom shaped uh, debt on top of it. And so yeah. I think leaders, quote unquote, all over the world uh, do not want China to implode. And so, you know, they're going to pour as much as your money uh, as it takes to try to stop that. Yeah. Well, you brought up uh, the debt problem and all these central bankers were in Jackson Hole. And Powell had like a more hawkish speech, you know, talked about how he needs to hire for longer. Uh, but at the same time, you have this fiscal spending still going on and they seem to be yeah, completely exactly. at odds with each other. Right. And the central bankers are like, well, we can't control that. And they just kind of like avoid any questions about the fact that we're still having massive uh, amount of uh, deficit spending going on. And, um, you know, where do you see the Fed going from here? Like, it seems to me that they're at odds with the fiscal uh, side of things. And, um, you know, you brought up how there's such a small amount of wealth propping up this giant bubble. I mean, just look at the public debt and it just keeps growing oh, yeah. uh, even, even now. So like, um, what do you think the central bankers are thinking about these? How do you think the central bankers are thinking about these things? It seems like they're in a, in a hard place right now, given monetary policy and the current fiscal situation. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, it, they are counteracting each other. So the Fed is trying to tighten, is trying to strangle the private economy. Uh, in, in, you know, of course, it's trying to do that to cover over or, or to hide the inflation that's been caused by government spending. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, the federal government is not playing along. So it just keeps spending. And it's kind of like <laughs> they're in a sense, they're working at odds. Um, and, you know, there's kind of this image among central bank junkies that Jerome Powell is like this honey badger, you know, like because he's so relatively hawkish for a central banker, meaning that he wants higher rates. And I, that narrative kind of annoys me <laughs> because Powell is not a badass. He's not a honey badger. He could stop the federal deficits immediately, he could just get up on a speech and he could say, guess what? We're not going to buy any more treasuries. And in fact, we're going to sell all the ones we have. We're going to sell them at, I don't know, 200 billion a month until they're all gone. And immediately that would spike rates so much that the federal government, the ones who are actually, by the way, the deficit is close to 200 billion a month. They would have to then rein that in or else 
the treasuries would end up going to confetti, the rates would spike. So Powell has mm -hmm. it in his power anytime he wants to stop the federal government. But instead, of course, he pretends that it's got nothing to do with him. There was a congressional hearing a couple months ago where one of the Congress things asked Powell if federal spending was part of the problem. And, and like, it, it looked like you'd offended his wife, you know, like he, yeah. he was like, what, you know, <laughs> yeah, he like stuttered and yeah, how, how dare you? That. You know, so, yeah. yeah. And then he went on how, um, you know, he doesn't have anything to say about the Fed, the uh, federal spending. And, you know, fundamentally because the Fed and Jerome Powell are aware that they can have a leash put on them anytime. Right. So I, uh, you know, that's that's why they, quote unquote, fight inflation. It's why they try to optimize economic growth. The reason is because they know that if they screw up bad enough, then the voters get angry. The politicians respond to that. And then the Fed is done. It becomes at best a captive part of Treasury. At worst, it just gets um, done in altogether, which, by the way, America has already closed two central banks. So we have it in us to close the third mm. uh, if it comes to that. Yeah, well, it seems like these central bankers, I mean, you had all this money printing that occurred in the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. You had these stimulus packages. Uh, you had all these massive QE programs again. Um, and they said, you know, we need to create inflation. They were literally trying to do that. Um, and then the inflation started to come up. And then they said, oh, this is just transitory. And then it was just complete panic. And they completely pivoted on their monetary policy, <clears> jacked interest <throat> rates up. And we had, you know, I think, three of the largest bank failures in history occur uh, as a result of this. And now they're just trying to create uh, more unemployment. So they're trying to make people lose their jobs. Um, and you're looking at yeah. the unemployment rate and it's still at multi-decade lows. And so how do you view the labor market right now? And um, because it still remains extremely tight, at least by the metrics that they're, they're sending out to us. Yeah, the labor market is a funny thing. So a lot of people dropped out of the labor force permanently during COVID. Uh, that you remember in 2021, we had really awful job shortages. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had CEOs of like small manufacturers coming in to get on the assembly line. Uh, it was impossible to hire like a roofer because, uh, you know, the guys would say, I can't get any assistance. Nobody wants to work because people were getting all this money on the couch. Now, a lot of that went away, of course, when the freebies um, ended, but there's still, you know, we've got about a million or a little bit over a million people who have permanently dropped out of the labor force. Actually, if we compare that to Trump, your trend is probably closer to 3 million or so. So we've got a lot of missing people. And I mean, you can see it if you walk around, like if you walk around any big city in America and you say, okay, we got three and a half percent unemployment. And then look at all the people who are just kind of chilling out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Maybe they're high. It's hard to tell. <laughs> like three and a half percent. I don't know. Something doesn't match here. And, you know, of course, what's squaring that is that the official unemployment numbers only count people who are looking for a job, which is cute because there's a lot of people who aren't looking for a job yeah. <laughs> either because, Collecting. you know, they're yeah, they're getting free sandwiches in front of the 7-Eleven or they're on government benefits or somewhere in between. Um, a lot of people retired early, bona fide, uh, during COVID. And then, you, you know, once you take your early retirement, it's hard to reverse that. You're not necessarily going to get back on your, on your, you know, pre, your sort of clean escalation uh, retirement benefits. So anyway, a lot of people did drop out of the market. And then the other point that I'd mentioned just on unemployment is that typically unemployment is a lagging indicator, means that it, it, it doesn't go down before a recession. It doesn't even go down early in a recession. It typically comes later in a recession. And the reason is that companies are always trying to hoard workers. They're trying to hold on to people mm -hmm. uh, because it's fantastically expensive to hire people, right? So the average in the US, it costs about 30% of a person's annual salary to hire for that position. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, they might not be up to speed. You know, depending on the skill level of the job, it might be months, might even be a year before they're really up to speed on the job. So it is amazingly expensive. That's the U.S. and Europe. I, I can't imagine how bad it is in Europe. Uh, you've got much, you know, it, it's a lot harder to fire people. It's also a lot harder to hire or it's harder to hire because it's hard to fire. 
right? So like if you're a French company and you hire somebody, you're almost marrying them. You know, you, you better hope you like them because it's going to be real hard to get rid of them. <laughs> so at any rate, the, the, the upshot is that companies tend to hold on to workers too long. Okay. And so we don't necessarily know what's happening in terms of the recession yet from the labor market. Um, what we are seeing, we just had some jobs numbers out the past couple of days where like openings, starting salaries, yep. right? There are these sort of early canaries in the coal mine that are suggesting that um, working hours. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Working hours. So labor demand is drying up, but actual jobs, you know, not only is that a lagging indicator, but given the labor shortages that we had two years ago, I think a lot of companies are very, very reluctant to let anybody whatsoever go uh, just in case they're wrong and the economy gets a second win. Hmm. So the Fed's focused on uh, backwards looking data as always, right? <laughs> Yeah, and um, they're very open about it. You know, they yeah. have whole conferences where they sit and try to figure out um, how did seasonal adjustment change. You know, most of the statistics that they come out with are dominated by these seasonal adjustments. And the seasonal adjustments, you know, so for example, uh, cash demand always goes up right, right before Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're the week before Christmas and you see a 2% rise in demand, you don't say, oh my God, what's happening? You say, well, yes, okay, you have to smooth that out because it's the week before Christmas. So that's seasonal adjustment. That's fine. That's legitimate. The problem is that they don't know what COVID did. And they've been saying that all through COVID, that these statistics are kind of blind because the magnitudes were so huge during COVID. Like almost any economic chart that you look at you know, you're kind of bumping along. Yeah, right. And then COVID, like now, you know, you got to zoom out the chart to the point that everything else just looks like a flat line. <laughs> I mean, it was it was just, crazy. It, it was mind blowingly stupid just <laughs> what they did during COVID from an economic perspective. And of course, the problem there is that those kinds, you know, there's social repercussions to that kind of um manipulation of an account or of, of, of a society but economically it also takes a long time for those for those things to work through so you know if you suddenly throw i don't know 40 percent of the population out of work for you know nine months i mean that has decade-long consequences in the labor market you've got people who didn't go to school or who changed maids i mean it, it's just we're going to be living with it for the rest of our life because those magnitudes were so enormous hmm. But right. Uh, yeah, sorry. But in this context, the upshot is that the Fed's statistics, they don't know exactly what they're adjusting for. Those seasonal adjustments are all way off. And so yeah. that can then, you know, when you've got a series that bona fide fluctuates by like plus or minus 0.2 percent and you've got these massive statistical adjustments that you don't know how to do. I mean, often they account for 70 percent or more of the data is actually adjustment. They I think. Um, they're flying blind. And, you know, Jerome Powell gave a quote, uh, what, a couple of days ago in his speech. He said, we are navigating by the stars under cloudy skies. Yeah. Uh, that, that is the consensus in the Fed. They honestly don't know what they're doing. Well, that's concerning because they've, another message that Powell said for the, really the last year or more has like, we're data driven, right? We're going to make our decisions. We're data driven, but you better hope that data is right. You know, <laughs> it's really difficult when you got these, all these historical averages, everything's blown out the last couple of years. Yeah. Like, how do you even know what's going on? So, you know, good well, luck this, to them. It, yeah. And this kind of goes to the Austrian versus Keynesian or um, really Austrian versus neoclassical, with, with, which is like the mainstream version of economics today, the neoclassical synthesis. Um, within Austrian, there's a lot more space for theory. Right. So, you know, for example, if the price of something goes up, people will demand less of it. Why? I don't need to statistically test this. This is logically verifiable. Right. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that we know from the theory. But modern neoclassical economics tends to view theory as almost like um, like superstition, like everything has got to be the data. Forget, you know, forget all of reality. Um, just what does the data say? And, and Milton Freeman was kind of the high priest of that. He famously during World War Two. Uh, he was tasked to develop a new kind of alloy uh, for use in, I don't know, planes, something like that. And so he went through and correlated all these different metals to get these, um, you know, features. And then he combined them all together and the thing shattered. And it was like, what do you know? Because individual statistics <laughs> don't work that way.
Um, <laughs> but, you know, Friedman is the father of positivism. And the idea there is that I don't want to know the theory. In fact, don't tell me the theory. I want to be innocent of the theory like a newborn babe, like a juror coming to the question for the first time. Just show me the data. Just and I'm going to do it all by the data. And that is literally their religion. And the problem in this case, the problem in general is that the data is pretty crappy um, in terms mm -hmm. of what the Fed decides. So there are lags to the data. A lot of things, you know, there's lags of like 18 months. So in other words, you got to make the decision today, but the thing doesn't happen for 18 months. Where's your data? Right at that point, you are driving a car at night and you're doing it really fast. So, you know, if mm -hmm. I were doing that, I would probably stop and get out of the car. In other words, close down the Fed. Um, <laughs> but they don't. Right. They, they keep running on this data, which by their admission, I mean, they are they are, you know, freely admit that there's an 18 month delay uh, on monetary data, begging the question, what what do you think you're navigating by? Because it's not the data. Yeah. Um, but in this case, that problem is even worse, right? It is catastrophically bad. Not only, you know, do they have the normal data deficiencies, but now they've got this COVID mess that just, it, it, it knocks all of their seasonal adjustments out. I mean, it's crazy. And, and still they're just going up to the microphone and they're saying, Hey, I think we're going to, you know, keep raising interest rates. It's like, they can't not yep. do they always have to do something, it seems like. Uh, they can't do nothing. Um, right. And so there's consequences to that. I mean, there's, there, there's real consequences to it. And we saw it in the banking sector, um, but also just in regular people. One of the things is housing affordability. You know, when interest rates go up this high, um, people can't afford homes. And what do you make of the mortgage rates being, what, at 25-year highs at 7.5%? I mean, what are the implications of this and where do you see the housing market going from here? Yeah, house prices are tricky. Um, you've got a lot of things that are working against each other. So on the one hand, we had this huge bubble uh, during COVID and there were a bunch of real reasons for that. Real in economics means not having to do with the money, but having to do with actual choices people make. Mm -hmm. You know, so people move. reasons for those balls. So they were, I think pretty much everybody was expecting that prices would come down after that was over. And then at that point, the question was, will inflation sort of catch up to meet it? Right. So the idea would be maybe the bubble goes up, it starts to come down, but then inflation picks it back up. Uh, so that happened to a certain degree. But then we came across a brand new problem, which is that the Fed raised rates so quickly that mortgage rates actually, you know, they went to seven and a half percent. That's a 25 year high. So at that point, people were locked into their homes, right? So all over the country, you've got millions of people who they got their mortgage at 3%. They probably got the mortgage at 3% when they're, you know, pre bubble. So when the house was not nosebleedingly expensive, all right. And they can pay that. But now if they sell their house, they'd have to move. And now they'd have to buy a house at these super high prices and they'd have yep. to buy it with a 7.5% mortgage. So now what we're seeing is this completely, I think it was broadly not predicted. I don't think anybody prominent thought that this would happen. But now what's happening is that the um, you know homeowners are just completely locked in. You've got this housing shortage. So now that housing shortage is bringing the prices up. So you had the bubble. We thought it was going to come down, that maybe inflation would, you know, keep it relatively elevated. And now the housing shortage is driving that up again. So you put that together with the seven and a half and it is, it, it, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible, especially for young people and millennials uh, who are looking to build a family, you know, to, to buy a house, you know, move out of their one bedroom and actually get someplace with a little bit of room. It is almost impossible for them. And so you hear a lot, especially for millennials who are just, they feel like they've been sold a bill of goods that you know they've been handed an inheritance of a country that has just been completely gutted. That they, you know they have no way out. Um, they can't qualify for a mortgage. The rents are skyrocketing. I think average rents are something like two thousand dollars now. Uh, anyway, they've gone up more than twenty percent over the past couple of years. Uh, so you've got these millennials who they are at the age where they should be starting to form a family. Instead. They're living with roommates, getting high because they don't feel like they have any future ahead of them. So I think, it, you know, what brought us here was the Fed. The Fed financed the lockdowns in the first place. One of my favorite examples, if you started out in COVID, right, and you imagine that some 
the government would be sitting around deciding what to do in any country in the world. And some junior minister would show up or one of his staffers, he would show up and he'd say, hey guys, I got an idea. Shut down the entire economy. Okay, we're going to reduce GDP by half. We're going to reduce tax revenue by half, but we can lay off government workers. Okay, they would have laughed him out of the room. That would have been it for him. He would have been off to wherever they, I don't know, Guam, wherever they exile people. <laughs> Instead, they didn't have to do that because they could say, oh, this is going to be awesome. We're going to shut down the entire economy and no problem because Jerome or, you know, whoever the central banker is in the country in question, he's just going to print it up. Okay, so the lockdowns could never have happened without the Fed. That's also true for the wars. It's true for a whole lot of things that governments spend trillions of dollars on that, you know, voters don't feel like those things actually cost any money because it doesn't. The Fed prints it and then the inflation is invisible, right? When the inflation yeah. comes along, then they say, ah, it's the greedy meat packers, the greedy workers, it's the, you know, it's the profits, it's the companies. Uh, they scapegoat everybody else under the sun. Yeah. I mean, you're touching on some of the, like the secondary effects of, of the money printing of these policies, um, the lack of family formation, you know, yep. birth rates are way down. Um, the unhappiness index, global unhappiness index is yeah. at, you know, highs and the young people specifically, this don't feel like there's a lot of hope and optimism. Um, and so a lot of people say Bitcoin is hope. Do you kind of agree with that statement? Do you think Bitcoin could help fix some of these problems when we look at this giant debt bubble? Um, how do you see that kind of playing out? Do you, do you think that Bitcoin's just like a tool or do you think this really is like a parallel system that's going to, provide a lot of hope for young people specifically. Yeah, so I think you got kind of two stages of Bitcoin. Um, one of them is the one that we're at now, which is that it's it's mostly lifeboat. Uh, I yeah. think that that is, you know, very legitimate. And we're orange pilling people <laughs> very quickly, uh, given the inflation rates. And, you know, again, it's, it's kind of an age thing. So uh, old people are, older people are coming on little by little, but especially young people, I think there's on... The sort of small government um, libertarian side, I think there is a wide consensus that hard money uh, is the solution and that Bitcoin specifically is the option. So I think for now, our job is mostly lifeboat. Um, you know, the question is fiat historically does not go quietly, it doesn't go on its own. It is so massively profitable that it would be astounding for them to give it up on purpose. Mm. Uh, so generally, it fails. And, you know, it could fail just because they are incompetent enough that voters demand some kind of reform, um, you know, either some kind of hard backing. If that happens in the near future, of course, it would be gold uh, just because people aren't familiar with Bitcoin yet um, or, you know, some other constraint. The ideal would be that they screw up like 1970s style or like they've been doing just enough so that we don't necessarily have to eat the, you know, the cats, uh, but enough people are kind of woken out of their stupor that they say, wait a minute, maybe there's something wrong with the current system. Yeah. So that's kind of the best case scenario. Uh, of course, we have this burgeoning censorship regime. Uh, you know, the institutions are just uniformly pro regime at this point. I think that a lot of people woke up to <laughs> the, the, the degree to which that had happened during COVID. But at any rate, um, those institutions are trying to sort of gaslight and cover these things up, right? So if mm -hmm. those are successful, then unfortunately, you know, you don't, the frog doesn't jump when the water gets a little bit hot, okay? Because you have all these gaslighters coming in and convincing them, it's not hot, it's Putin's price hike, man. It'd be yeah. over in just a sec. Okay, and so then they sit tight and they say, OK, maybe next month, maybe next year. And then at that point, the water does actually get hotter and hotter. And, you know, I, I think there is no natural break um, once a fiat system gets uh, corrupted the way that ours is. Um, you know, there's not necessarily a natural break that's going to bring it back except for voter anger. And the trick is, will that voter anger, you know, will it? be reliably expressed to politicians in time to do something about it rather than being suppressed long enough that the problem snowballs and then it ends up exploding. So I very much hope the former. That's partly why I do what I do. Um, I want to remind the frog what the temperature is. I want to talk about what the temperature used to be and what the temperature is now and what it's headed towards because I want the frog to do something about it now rather than waiting until things actually do collapse yeah, get in the lifeboat. Yeah.
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the water is probably hotter than they're saying, right? Because the the CPI is another one of those metrics. Oh, um, for sure. I, yeah. I was wondering, um, you know, people people have shown that 1970s chart of of CPI, and it's just kind of that Twin Peaks. It comes down, kind of like what we've experienced the last year or so, and then it kind of shoots back up uh, to end out that decade. And then it obviously led with the the Volcker. It ended with the Volcker rate hikes in the early 80s. Um, what are the odds you think we see a similar pattern play out here? Uh, maybe what's some of the pros uh, for that argument? What's maybe some of the argu- uh, arguments for against that? I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, so I think what is driving that kind of double peak, um, both in the 70s and today, is money creation. And the Fed has actually reined in money creation uh, over the past year. Powell knows enough economics that he recognizes that he himself causes the inflation, whatever he says in public. Uh, so they've been reining that in pretty quickly. And so that that is one of the reasons why inflation has come down. Uh, there are other idiosyncratic reasons, but you, you know, money supply is currently shrinking at the fastest rate since the 1930s. So it's down about 5% year on year, which is uh, pretty epic for the money supply. Usually the money supply grows about 6 or 8%, uh, like in normal times. You're talking M2 so, there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry, M2. Uh, so M2 is down by about uh, 5% year over year. If that continues, then I don't think that um, we're going to see a double, uh, uh, um, a double peak. Gotcha. Um, what could set that wrong is if, you know, first off, if a recession does hit, then the government is going to spend a crap load more money. Uh, COVID in many ways broke a lot of seals in terms of just how much money you can hand out to people. Um, Voters, of course, love getting free money. You know, uh, I think if we have, or in the next recession we have, there's probably going to be a big push for a universal basic income, which would institutionalize that kind of trillion dollar handout. You know, we basically have uh, what we had in COVID, but forever. So I think recession, they are, they always cause an enormous, um, flood of money printing. Uh, And then on top of that, of course, we have what's happening with the banks. So they headed off the bank crisis largely by pre-bailing out all the banks. So they're they're lending the money based on fictitious asset prices. Uh, They essentially uh, guaranteed all of the deposits, even for millionaires in America, which was, was kind of an astounding expansion. I mean, that that was essentially a $19 trillion (laughs) bailout um, to the entire banking system. And, you know, these things just kind of passed without comment. So I think that that's a big reason why the banks started falling is because they're not collapsing anymore. They're just accessing your money directly. Uh, So I think we've got the BTFP facility has something like $2 trillion in lending authority. Uh, There's more where that came from. You know, none of these things have congressional authority, so they can just cook them up in their free time. Yeah. Uh, so they've essentially said that they are willing to pump an unlimited amount of money into the system. Now, what that means is that, you know, I wouldn't bet on more bank crashes. Uh, I think we'll probably get some small ones, but we now have a system where everything is going to be bailed out immediately. Now, that's a problem for the long run, of course, because it encourages um, banks to gamble, right? So one of the Things you can count on in finance, one of the uh, sort of standard relationships is risk and return. If an asset is riskier, it will pay you more. This is a universal in finance. So if you've told every bank in America that we're going to bail you out, then guess what happens next? (laughs) So I I think we're saving up an enormous, really an insurmountable um, bailout for the future. But in the near term, that's what I'd watch for, right? On the one hand, Powell is shrinking M2. On the other hand, the recession, the expanding bank bailouts, the the pre-bailouts and the whatever leakage that then sends out into the system under the surface, I think those will be the two um, culprits or the two likeliest culprits if we get a double dip. And an interesting question at that point is, what if we do get a 1970s double dip, right, where inflation was up and then it looked like it was chilling out and then it exploded again? In the 70s, we had Volcker, right? And Volcker had balls of steel. He walked in there and he said, okay, I'm going to end inflation. He went almost, I think it was 19% interest rates. I mean, it was shock and awe. And, of course, the problem is that uh, Volcker was appointed by Jimmy Carter, and Jimmy Carter lost the election, And by all accounts, in Washington, the sort of Washington folklore of that era is that Jimmy Carter lost it because of Volcker. 
So the next Volker <laughs> won't get hired. Okay, because now presidents know that if you hire somebody with balls, you've written your political... Uh, anyway, you won't win yeah. your next election. I got to be careful with language these days. You never know. <laughs> you never what know. Censors are listening. I can't use the kind of colorful language I'm used to. <laughs> At any rate, they know they will not win the next election. So I think it is a lot more challenging, that kind of Volcker scenario, uh, if we're hoping to have a white knight rescue in and, you know, sort of do sort of um, slam inflation the way that Volcker did. Yeah, you make a great point in terms of the moral hazard that's created when they came out with yep. these rescue programs. So like, banks will probably just take more <laughs> risk now, right? And of that will course. create more bubbles, and that will create a situation down the road where the the central bank will have to come in again, and and the debt will even get higher. And in that situation, um, people will start to look at our debt problem long term and say, you know, they're already saying is this sustainable? And a lot of people think no. And so will foreign investors start to wonder? And then obviously the currency is tied closely to the, to the bond market of a country. And right. right now you have the BRICS nations kind of coming out, kind of gathering forces. They just expanded the group um, at their recent summit. And there's a lot of talk around de-dollarization. Even, even Janet Yellen said a comment a couple months ago that she was like, yeah, the dollar will lose reserve currency status, but slowly, <laughs> but slowly. <laughs> it's, and, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and, I'm, and so there's a lot of talk around the dollarization and the BRICS. And um, I know you, you kind of spoke on it recently. So what were your thoughts about the expansion um, to, I think, um, was it five or six nations joined the club? Yeah. Yeah, they did plus six. It's about 400 million people. So that's about the population of South America. But it includes Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE, which are, you know, two of the biggest oil exporters. Mm. And that's kind of continuing a trend where the West is uh, getting rid of its, you know, oil production, its mineral production. We're really kind of giving away the basics of the foundations of the economy and handing those out to countries where green activists don't have any influence. Like if you're a green activist in China, you're going to have a really short career. You're not going to be at it long. Uh, they don't listen to these guys. They know that it's a joke. Um, yeah. And, it, it, you know, what's what's driving this sort of big picture? I mean, first of all, it was hilarious that, you know, Janet Yellen, after years of denying, you know, calling um, de-dollarization like a crazy conspiracy theory. And then just matter of factly, she's like, well, yes, of course it's happening because the world is getting bigger. <laughs> what, what it's what? very Janet Yellen. It's a Janet Yellen pivot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> she was like, you have to be crazy not to know that. Everybody knows that. Um, which, I mean, that's that's really how they operate these days, really, yeah, right. really across the board. But, um, but at any rate, you know, what's driving it, I think, above all is, number one, it's just Chinese bribes. I mean, China pays countries to exit the dollar or because China views itself. Basically, China's trying to build an empire. I don't know why they are. Our empire does no good for us. I'd like if they want our empire, I would just assume, yeah, here, here you go. <laughs> here's all the bills here. Here's everything that's still owed on it. So good luck. <laughs> Um, but at any rate, China, China wants this for national prestige reasons or whatever, um, maybe because politically connected people will profit from it as they do in ours. Um, but right. So China bribes all these countries. It gives them cheap loans. Uh, it's got a development bank. So these countries line up to join that. So that's one attraction for these countries. And then the other hand is U.S. weaponization of the dollar. So really the dramatic one there was the U.S. seizing Russia's central bank dollars Yep. Uh, they did that right when Putin invaded Ukraine. And, and the reason was to try to crash the Russian banking system and hopefully lead to riots. And then, you know, they wanted Putin on a string uh, the way they did in Libya. Uh, it didn't work out that way. Actually, it was our banks that collapsed, ironically enough, uh, for unrelated reasons. <laughs> but the problem with that, of course, Putin's bad. And yes, but the problem is that even during the Cold War, we had never seized the dollars of any sovereign uh, central bank, because it, including when we had, you know, hot wars, uh, hot proxy wars going on in multiple continents with the Soviet Union, we never did that because we were run by adults who understood that you even want your enemies to be reliant on you, right? So they understood that the key, one of the sort of linchpins to American might in the world and respect was the U.S. dollar. 
so what happened when they seized Putin's uh, dollars, they seized about $400 billion, which in terms of the Russian economy, that's about $4 trillion. Okay, so that was a chunk of change. That was mm -hmm. enough that it seemed reasonable that that would crash the Russian banking system. Uh, it, was, it was no small amount. And the problem is that that put the other 200, 180 developing countries in the world on notice that they could be next. Yeah. Right. So the dollar all of a sudden went from being this um, almost gold in terms of politics, like nobody will ever touch your dollars, man, it's cool, to now it, it, it became a very dangerous asset to own. And so you almost immediately you had guys like the president of Indonesia say he wasn't sympathetic to Putin, but he was saying, look what happened to Russia. They could do this to us. Maybe it's great. Uh, and, you know, you can imagine that being green policy. Uh, the U.S. has even uh, pushed countries on on LGBT, uh, on union policy, on, uh, you know, abortion. I mean, topics that should have nothing to do with the dollar. But the U.S. administration has become uh, very responsive to domestic activists who want to use them to promote whatever their pet project is, whether it's, you know, carbon dioxide or so on. Um, so, you know, the U.S., uh, they made threats to Uganda over their LGBT law. Uh, there was a lot of interference, including by Rahm Emanuel, the ambassador to Japan. Uh, they were interfering in Japan's domestic debate about uh, LGBT. So, mm. you know, by doing it to Russia, they sort of showed the world that the U.S. can do this. And now the question is just, OK, is the bar so high that you have to invade a neighbor in order to have the U.S. try to destroy your economy and get your leaders strung up by their ankles? Or is that a lower bar? And unfortunately, I think a lot of these countries are concluding that that may be a lower bar. So you've got China bribing them out. You've got the U.S. sort of scaring them out. And so you put those together and, you know, a lot of money in the interim, it's going to assets like the euro or the yen or even gold. Um, the game changer would be... And they didn't do that this year, but the game changer would be if uh, BRICS or Russia um, or China created some sort of a gold-backed rail. So some kind of an independent currency, uh, like a BRICS currency, that could then act as a dollar substitute. It would not be a national currency because in this day and age, no country wants to have a strong currency domestically because that would hit their exports. Mm. Uh, a couple of years ago, Europe had a sovereign crisis and the Swiss franc skyrocketed. I think it like doubled in, I don't know, a matter of months. And Switzerland just panicked and it just sold all the francs it could and bought euro in order to weaken it. So politically, no country uh, wants a strong currency. They all want weak currencies. So it will not be the Chinese yuan that would replace the dollar. And not only is it a crappy currency, it's controlled, but no country wants that. No, it'd be an independent gold-backed rail. Now, China and Russia have both flirted with the idea. They've floated it. The Russian embassy in Kenya, which sounds as random as it is, but they always leak things. <laughs> they were in the news a couple months ago, uh, floating that you know they were gonna um, that the BRICS summit was gonna come out with a gold-backed currency. That did not happen, shockingly. Um, but they're interested in it. And moreover, in sort of a game theory perspective, if they were to do that, um, you know, if China or Russia or some other collection of countries were to gather together and have some sort of a gold-backed currency, that would wipe the floor with the U.S. dollar. It would be a stronger store of value if it were genuinely redeemable, as in you could take those scraps of paper to your local whatever, Bricks Bank, and they'll actually give you shiny pieces of metal. That would... <laughs> It would not only end the U.S. I mean, it wouldn't do it overnight, but it would end the U.S. dollar. It would end all fiat, right? Fiat can only exist because there is no common use currency that has sufficiently low transaction costs to replace fiat, right? You would need something based on gold or, of course, something based on Bitcoin. Unfortunately, given how um, smart governments have been, how quickly they've been to grasp even how Bitcoin works, I think Bitcoin is... I'm not holding my breath. I think we're going to need another generation of bureaucrats entering government who actually know what Bitcoin is uh, before Bitcoin could be a contender for that 20 years at least. Yeah. Yeah, the wep weaponization of the U.S. dollar, uh, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. And um, not only it was it wasn't just the Russian reserves, they actually did it to Afghanistan, too. Um, and oh, yeah. whether you agree with it or not, they, they seized their reserves and then they did what they wanted with it. Um, while while the people were starving there, 
Um, and, and so you have these countries that are now thinking we need to diversify our reserve assets. We need to prepare for this like seizure risk, essentially, that now exists. And that's why I see record buying of gold from these central banks, I think, around the world. Um, but, you know, maybe they'll turn to Bitcoin. It seems to if they want to do a gold back bank or like new currency that's backed, um, it seems like it would be kind of going backwards, in my opinion. And you have mm -hmm. this wonderful payment technology that exists that's neutral and apolitical. If they did choose Bitcoin, I think that would kind of be, make them very competitive on the global stage. But I agree. I, I think we're kind of far away uh, from that reality. But um, it, it's going to be very, very interesting um, couple decades, I think, to see how this multipolar world sure. kind of starts to play out. Um, but Peter, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I mean, this was an awesome conversation. Um, where, where, where do you want to point people to just to follow your work and, and hear more about your, uh, your takes and your opinions on the markets? Sure. I do uh, daily videos. They go up on Twitter. I'm at Prof Stange, uh, P-R-O-F-S-T-O-N-G-E. i well, also got a website, peterzanange.com, and I got articles and weekly podcast where you can hear all of the daily videos all in one go awesome well that's another great wrap for uh, for swan signal live peter you have a wonderful day my friend and keep educating people about bitcoin you've been doing it since 2014 so really appreciate you uh sharing your expertise and and being on our team uh, the bitcoin uh team so thank you so much for coming on the show and for all your work of course thank you for having me on sam really appreciate it all right Well, uh, folks, that's a wrap for Swan Signal Live. Once again, you can join, uh, you can look at PacificBitcoin.com for tickets today. If you go to PacificBitcoin.com and then go codename promo signal, uh, go check it out. You can get 21% off your tickets today. Um, so thank you for joining, and that's a wrap. <laughs>